Hi, welcome to another uh, episode of the Strategic Business Advisor podcast. Today we have a very uh, special guest, unique guest, Richard Blank. He started uh, Costa Rica call centers. Uh, he's got a collection of antique jukeboxes that uh, he's, he's got all kinds of uh, interesting collections, very interesting guy. And rather than botch his intro, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to him, and let him introduce himself to you. All right. Hey, Richard, welcome to the show. Kerry, so happy to be here today as your special guest for you and your audience. And yes, I am the CEO of Costa Rica's call center. I collect classic jukeboxes, pinball machines, and it's very important for me to have a gamification culture for the call center industry, just to make sure to balance the work and life and the fun. Cool, very cool. Um, so let's talk about how you how do you get to Costa Rica from America? I think you, in, in our conversation before, you said you're from Philly, from Philadelphia. Uh, Northeast yeah. Philly boy, graduated Abington in 91, and I doubled down on my favorite language, which was Spanish, and was a Spanish communication major in Arizona. And at 27 years old, I was given a one and a million opportunity to come to Costa Rica for a couple months to work in my friend's call center. Now, Carrie, if you can get past your parents' guilt, you can live anywhere in the world. And I decided <laughs> to bank on my become an expatriate, learn the industry. And where we are today, my friend, 22 years later. Yeah, uh, a real success story. Um, I guess, <clears throat> you know, uh, the, most of the audience for this podcast are, are business people, uh, entrepreneurs, uh, you know, people who've started their own business. What are some of the things that you've learned along the way that you could share with them that they could relate to or maybe might be new to them? I would think starting a, a call center, which is kind of a specialty business in my book, but in another culture, not only another language, another culture, that's really important. What was that like for you? That's the next one question, Kerry. Well, first, I needed specialists. Definitely an attorney in Costa Rica to understand the labor laws, an accountant, and a human resources department. So they were able to cover that certain area for me. Now, I myself, when I worked at my friend's center for four years, I didn't start as a C-level executive. I was with the Ticos, with the telemarketers. I, I got to see the good and the bad. Right. And after four years of working at my center, my friend's center, I saw the business from the inside and out. And the one thing I saw that was lacking, and it wasn't my friend's fault, it's just any sort of article, was that the agents felt expendable. Sometimes they didn't have their dignity. And me being a business owner, I wanted to extend as much empathy as possible just to be able to reduce attrition, have people feel a little bit more comfortable in an industry that has a very high turnover and a burnout. And some people do look at telemarketers a certain way because of movies such as The Wolf of Wall Street or Boiler Room, Glen Gary, Glen Ross. I, I can yeah, assure you, Carrie, that we're never going to call you during dinner. If we do, we can't be <laughs> friends anymore. All right. Well, <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, that's a very important point, point that you brought up is that people don't feel appreciated. Um, Correct. You know, that's that's one of the things I run into with the with the business uh, clients that I work with is, you know, they there's a disconnect because what the employees see is the business owner is concerned about his business success, his success, you know, financial success, and what what they call the lifestyles of the rich and shameless. It's all, it's all about the the owner, right? And very little about the employee. Other than, Did you get your work done? You know, did you come in on time today? Stuff like that, rather than, is there anything you need to do your job? Can I help you with anything? Do you need help with anything? What about your career? Is there any training we can get you for your career to further you on? How's your family doing? You know, things like that. That, And again, the big the big thing that, that shows up is missing is, he doesn't care about me, you know? And care is essential to trust. And, you know, trust is essential to any human interaction. Now that at some level there's trust, I show up for work, I'm gonna get paid, you know? But outside of that, you know, would, would you trust would you trust them to help you with something? No, they don't care about me. Anyway. Well, to um, give and a take, I, I was very fortunate to be able to start my business. But, you know, the main goal is to see how many families I could feed. I am a guest in this country. I am from Philadelphia, living in Costa Rica. And so I just wanted to make sure this experience was positive. I didn't want to compromise any ethics values. I'm very selective of the clients and the campaigns that come in here. But it, it's very easy to run a business. You just have to make sure to reduce any sort of fear to give everybody that works with you 
all of their resources. And the best bosses were the ones that walked in those shoes. I, for the fact that, you know, the best coaches were the ones that played football. Right. So they understand the grind <clears throat> and the tackles. And for me, it's very easy for me to put myself into their shoes and to find the certain diplomatic and strategic motivational words to give them, to get them through a certain tough day. But no, I'm a very hands-on boss. In fact, I believe in gamification. We were mentioning uh, pinball machines and, and jukeboxes. Well, I have an environment where people can let off steam, recharge batteries, and, and make friends from other departments. So it's very important for me to have certain spaces in my call center that's just not work-related. So they can feel even more community oriented and assist me in building this sort of special culture that we have here. Wow. So you have like, face it, I mean, they can play pinball, play jukeboxes. Oh, my good friend. I got one of the largest pinball collections in Central America. One man's trash is another man's treasure. Now, you know that a lot of these arcades are going out of business in the States. Could you imagine Costa Rica? Mm -hmm. So I may have to drive a couple hours to kick a tire in a bodega, find an old pinball machine, take it off their hands for a couple hundred dollars. Wow. And the next thing you know, after a little bit of restoration, I'm sitting on a, a mint condition, wow. plastic machine that are older than most of the agents that work here. And <laughs> so as I'm saying, I, I'm able to balance my own personal interest. I have the space for it. Fortunately, I have the resources and a very forgiving wife. But uh, combining all of that, yes, I have created a, a fun game room for my clients, for my agents, and even for myself. Wow, that's that's impressive. I gotta say, it's impressive. Um, so, <clears throat> what are your, you know, one of one of my contentions is that business owners always have to be scanning the horizon for opportunities as well as perils or risks that are coming at them because, you know. The, there are opportunities to take advantage of. There are perils you want to navigate around, net, negate, you know, get rid of, do something with, or, you know, you could you could land up on the rock, so to speak, with your business. What are some of the opportunities you see coming? You see any perils on the horizon? What are some of the things you're looking out for? Well, the positive part, my friend, is that I have a luxury of a track record that I believed in myself and it, and it came through. So I got nothing else to prove and I'm very comfortable financially. So I, I don't need to beg for an account to keep my lights on. Now, the challenges that we have, when COVID hit, I was fortunate enough to have a business that was allowed to be uh, virtual. So I did send the majority of my agents to work from home. Uh, you know, by having a brick and mortar call center, it gave a lot of uh, stability to my clients because of our internet redundancy Mm -hmm. our backup generator and our immediate IT support. By people working at home, there may be a disruption every now and again, but the main thing that I've noticed is that call centers are a very social environment for speaker, and we can feed off of energy. Yeah. And so by having someone isolated, they might not have a faster ramp up time or you'd be able to get this sort of tips and tricks of somebody that's on a hot streak that week. Mm -hmm. There's a sort of essence that has been lost from the call centers when you're sending everybody home. And so those are some of the things that I've seen that have changed the industry. And, and also a lot of companies that prefer to do omni-channel non-voice support, such as chat and email. Okay, we both know that's very, go ahead. Say, say that again, what is that, omni what? Omni-channel non-voice support. Like if you if you contacted okay, for, a company us, and all they have are forms. Yeah, for us non-technical people, tell us what that omni. Filling out a form sending an email, no phone call, no, no, no phone number to reach anybody. And a lot of companies will only have a chat support or an email address. And that can be very frustrating for somebody because the latency, the miscommunication, yeah. the fact that you don't feel like things are getting resolved. And if you do happen to get somebody on a phone call after all of that communication, your, your stress level is much more elevated. The chances of a resolution. I, I, I can attest to that. <laughs> so for me, I always believe that a client is willing to speak with somebody and it gives you and I a chance to have client retention, to do an upsell, get a referral. And I always believe some of the best sort of business relationships could be from an exit interview. I could find out areas in which you and I need to improve or what our competition did in order to earn that business. So by taking away any sort of voice interpersonal communication, I think you are limiting 
the sort of relationship building and the value that you would have in the clients that work with you. So these are the sort of changes that I see that may be a little bit more challenging for the industry, but there are certain techniques that we have that are able to work around that and still be effective. Hmm. So you see that as, a, as, a, as sort of a, I guess, a challenge or some a risk that's coming down the road for call centers that people don't want to, some clients just don't want to have, they don't want to give people the ability to call in. They don't, and, and, and I agree with you on that. It, What's the word? I think it severs the human connection because like you're explaining it, if, if all you're doing is emailing and chatting and you're not getting anywhere, especially if you're chatting with some AI bot, that it's not real human. When I call in, I, I do not, I do not do the whole menu thing. I always agent, 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 agent until I get somebody because I don't want, exactly. I don't want to talk to some, you know, supposedly AI that's going to be able to address my concerns. They can't, no, I agree. Least, not to my so satisfaction. You know. It can work with you, but when you're on the phone with somebody live, there's a little bit more attentive, active listening. You can build the rapport, use a Me Too technique, positive escalations when you're complimenting others, using military alphabet to confirm email addresses so there's no bounce back. So I'm telling you, there's a lot of benefits by still having a portion of your business to be voice work. And um, if a company chooses not to do that, you and I also have the luxury of choosing another company. If it's an inelastic market and you have no choice, then my friend, wait in the line, wait in the queue and hope for the best. Right, right. No, I agree with you. I think that the, the human connection is really very important because I mean, <clears throat> try and talk to somebody at Amazon. You know, I, I dug for a day, I think I finally found a phone number and really didn't get anybody you know, so you just you just got this big behemoth of a behemoth of a, a company, mm -hmm. and if you can't get your whatever you want resolved through the channels they offer, you're out of luck. You know, makes you not want to deal with Amazon. And I, and I use Amazon as just one of many examples out there. Um, yeah, I, I think the I think the human element, the the connection you say. Um, person to person is extraordinarily valuable and the companies I think that overlook that or you know dismiss that um, do so at their own peril and we can talk about Amazon for a second they have a presence here Amazon HP Intel Oracle and some of the larger centers such as Sykes Teleperformance Centris and Convergence so we compete but the agents in Amazon they're with thousands not saying that they're not incredible or have the chance to be promoted or grow with a company, but some people prefer to work with smaller call centers like myself, where they can make a name for themselves. They have the luxury of choosing a campaign where they might feel more fulfilled. So as much as Amazon may be the Goliath and they're huge and they're, you know, scooping up all the level one support, it also is to my benefit not to take those people and to scale with brand new agents. Right. that have never worked at a call center before where you and I can mold them and they're not coming in with bad habits. So right. it's a give and a take, my friend. It just depends on how you zig and zag with the situations that come upon you. Yeah, right. No, I agree. So what would you say is your biggest, uh, what's your biggest concern in, in your business? Or what is it? Is there some kind of struggle or some chronic something that comes up or nothing really? Uh, well, it's our, it's our attrition rates in the call center industry. In the United States, people see it as a burnout yeah. or a transitional type of job. And from Hollywood glorification telemarketers, some people, you know, almost gives it a bad eye, a black eye. Yeah. But we usually have more of a natural attrition. People will leave us for a scheduling conflict because of the university. A boyfriend or girlfriend could be working at that location, could be closer to their home to save time in regards to transportation if they're working on site. Mm -hmm. Occasionally there are projects that pay more money and more lucrative, right. but nobody will leave my call center because I defaced them on the floor, made them cry, right. had them do a walk of shade. Right. But my concern, my friend, is the fact that we don't get two weeks notices. Some people will just peace out on me, pull a space ghost and the next thing you know, I'm scrambling to fill a seat for my client unexpectedly. But the benefit of that is that I'm accountable for the projects that are at Costa Rica's call center. So I immediately call the client, let them know what's happening, have a solution. And the best relationships are built when you can get through chaos together. Right. 
So if I'm very forthright and there's no surprises, I can really earn the respect of my clients. And that's enabled me to sustain my business for so long. Yeah, that's, that's great. So do you have some secret to client retention? I mean, I thought of just good service. Once again, it's, it's, it's being very forthright. The clients have to understand expectations. They, they may need a, a small class in regards to our local Costa Rican labor laws because some things that are done in the United States, certain holidays, or even a certain company culture, or let's just say there's a very enthusiastic supervisor in the United States that uses choice language, mm -hmm. or maybe a little more aggressive compared to assertive, right. might not be a good fit here. Uh, not saying I don't want the business, but I gotta make sure that the agent can go home and tell their parents what they do for a living. So it's really not about fulfilling the need of the client. It's a seller's market here. I just have to ensure that the agent is satisfied and is able to complete the work for the client. But it, it's very easy to work with somebody and I would prefer to have clients that judge me on merit over price because it's very difficult for us to compete with the offshore call centers in regards to their price in India, Philippines, and the Middle East mm -hmm. because we're near shore. I'm Central America. We're considered the Switzerland <laughs> of Central America. So naturally there is competition and the prices go up. So as, if somebody is willing to keep an open mind, put me on a level playing field, realizing that my sort of structure, my agents and my coaching might give me a 0.25 more an hour than it could potentially offset any sort of cost that they may have somewhere else, and I can earn those seats. Hmm. So do you, do you mainly uh, address the Spanish speaking market? Do you do anything in the States? That's a great question. Naturally, my agents are bilingual, which bears right. the mark of higher education. The majority of my clients need these agents in case a Latino client comes up on a list, but the majority of the calls are done in Spanish. And I've seen these agents, once again, with their uh, sort of intense concentration levels because they're translating and working at the same time. I find them to be brilliant. I mean, it, these individuals come in with such structure and discipline. And it's my responsibility to increase their vocabulary with a thesaurus, certain parts of grammar, maybe a genre of a section of the United States, or just happen to have them write out words phonetically so they can adjust the vowels to speak it properly. Mm -hmm. So there is no miscommunication. So to me, I still see the art of speech and it's fascinating because these agents do a lot of dedicated practice outside of the office. Besides putting in their 40 hours a week, obviously they're reading, writing, listening English. Hmm. And they'll come to me with a new phrase or vocabulary word or just an expression that they'd like to implement on the phone. And I love things like that. As long as people are continuing their forward motion, they're only gonna keep getting better, Carrie. You know, I had no idea that they, yeah. But that makes sense if they would practice their English away from the job and come to you with what well, they come with you with uh, idiomatic expressions like am I saying this properly or they, they have questions about you know is this a, a proper way to ask this question I'm, I'm sure, they'll ask me for questions. recommendations and I'll tell them to watch old Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce Sherlock Holmes BBC episodes or to study Pierce Brosnan as Remington Steele or Dirk Benedict as the face man on the AT right. and just you know, listen to these amazing glib speakers and see if you can pull something from them. Right. Oh, okay. That's interesting. That, yeah. That'd be good. Yeah. Thinking about it, that'd be a good place for them to, to learn. You know, people who can't have them well. watching boring stuff. They have to be fun on the, on the TV. <laughs> yeah. That makes sense. Cool. Um, what if somebody were wanting to start a business in Costa Rica, what advice would you give them? And I know I, I'm, I know of several people that are interested in at least having some operations in Costa Rica. So say I wanted to start up, I don't know, something, uh, some kind of a, a South America, Central American subsidiary of a, a, somebody who sold safety products, you mm -hmm. know, fire extinguishers, that kind of stuff they want to set up in Costa Rica. What advice would you, you give them uh, in terms of coming down there? Well, fortune favors the brave. Once again, you have to realize you're a guest in another country and the things that you hold to such high esteem or may work for you back in the United States may not work here. 
So can, my suggestion can you give would some examples of that. Oh, of course. I think legally, we should okay. definitely understand the labor laws and the taxes here. You what, don't what get into trouble some of the with the differences law. in labor laws. Say, okay. For an example, here we have an aguinaldo. So there's a 13th month. If someone works for you for 12 months in a row during Christmas, they're going to get a 13th month of salary. There's eight double pay holidays here. If you're doing overtime on salary, it's time and a half, and there's certain sort of hours that you can work during the graveyard shifts. And there's certain expectations you have of the agent. You can't, once again, force a fit or ask them to do something outside of their work scope or depress them too much because they are signing a contract for a certain type of work that they're doing here. You just can't take someone from customer service and immediately throw on the sales or then to IT support. Right. So these are the sort of things you have to be very careful with. In addition to that, as I'm saying, the cursing, the vocabulary, the sort of aggressive behaviors that people may have in the United States, which may work, could land you into some sort of trouble down here oh, with regards yeah. to your reputation. Also believe there's financial responsibility. You should never hold back a, a paycheck. You should always pay your taxes and your insurance. And these are the sort of things for me that I had to do in order to maintain this sort of reputation because I don't use an alias. My information is all over the internet and I'm very active in regards to our call center community here with a 98,000 person Facebook page, which I'm gonna be putting you on, which shares all of the business process outsourcing industry here. So if you're looking to come in to do a quickie one and done, test the waters, you know, bull in a china shop and then leave those are the sort of individuals that may give us a bad <clears throat> reputation here the ones that don't pay payrolls and just leave town don't pay their rent do certain things so yeah, i'm no, yeah no i'm talking about people who actually want to come down be there have a presence take advantage of a uh, labor market some of the cheaper labor there that kind of so maybe there's some strategic reason to be in Central America. Sure, well, if that's what you're be. looking for. We have an amazing infrastructure. The cost of living is about mm -hmm. a third. Same with the salaries. But depending on the sort of profile of the agent that you're looking for. Wow. But if you're expecting to come down here, snap your fingers and have a line of a thousand people waiting to work for you, you're sadly mistaken. Yeah. Your friend with this company will be competing against Amazon. You should make those, you should make those salaries extremely competitive. He's got to make sure that whatever he's offering is very straightforward. People can understand it and that they will come on board and work with you. Because if there's some smoke and mirrors and a bait and a switch, trust me, on a lot of these online communities, they're going to say, avoid this place like a plague. They don't pay. They're kind of shady. It's uncomfortable. They're not properly preparing us. The CRM system's bad. The lights are off. They had coffee. So it's, it's a very delicate situation here. And my number one suggestion is that they learn to speak Spanish well, because initially off the bat, they could be showing very good faith. And there's many different mediums in which to be able to communicate your ideas with your agents. Right. So I myself was able to earn that respect the old school way, maybe as you would see it, the hard way. Mm -hmm. So you, but you already learned Spanish for the most part before you went down there. Right? Oh yeah. I was a Spanish communication major in college. I interned for Telemundo and worked for the importers of Corona prior to Costa Rica. So, wow. I, I, so you were you were actually totally fluent before you went down there? 100%, yes. Oh, okay, okay. Not, yeah. And yeah, some of the people I know going down there, they would have to actually learn Spanish. You know, Which is not a problem. If you yeah. just sit down for six months of intensive study of your grammar, the rest is just vocabulary. Some people quick, uh, pick it up even quicker. Yeah. And as long as you have that background of a romantic language, Spanish, French, Italian, Portuguese, it's very easy just to look at the verb conjugations and see the sort of similarities that you have between these languages. So you should right. be able to pick it up pretty fast. Right, right. Cool. Um, do you have much American, uh, much of your labor force is American down there? Or it's all Costa Rican. That's a great question. There's a huge expatriate population here, a lot of retirees ah. because medical tourism is here. You got the best medical care really? and the cost of living is a fraction of the United States and the weather is great. And, and so a lot of the local Costa Ricans become very attuned to the North American market, not only because they've lived there, have family there, have traveled there, but there's so many interactions that they have 
with the Anglo-Saxon, with the North Americans, that it's very is easy. Is that what they call uh, US, US citizens is Anglo-Saxons? Anglo-Saxon, yes, Saxons. that's another expression. Of, or we could call ourselves an extranjero, which is a foreigner. But these are the different words, as I say, that I could share with people to show that I've done my due diligence as they've done learning English. Right. And so it's just an excellent way to start off strong. You're almost starting on third base, if you think about it. Hmm. Hmm. So do you have, do you have many Americans in your, in your staff there? I do, but these are the individuals that have legal paperwork to be able to right. earn a living in Costa Rica. And uh, most of them have dual citizenship where they either grew up in the States, have family there, uh -huh. but um, a lot of them have never been to the United States. So it allows me to represent my country in the best light. And so that's why I'm a very hands-on boss. I want them to know me and to give them their, their dignity and to extend as much empathy as I can to these individuals. That's fantastic. Um, in terms of uh, benefits and stuff, I know here in the States is, you know, like group health insurance, maybe some group life that you pay for, group dental, group vision, you know, 401k plan, uh, that kind of stuff. What do they have comparable uh, down in Costa Rica? Well, they have their, their, their insurance and also they have their investments as well in the Caja where they invest their money. If they've been with me for so many years, they can cash out big time. It's almost like our own 401k. Mm -hmm. and so the labor laws are very supportive of the employee. So it's great for them. It, it's very, it'd be very difficult for someone to take advantage of an agent legally here. Mm. And since it is a seller's market and there are a lot of options, the Costa Ricans have the luxury of choosing campaigns that follow the rules. Right. So it, right. it makes it for a very clean society where people feel very comfortable investing here. Mm. Okay. So it sounds like it's fairly similar. It, 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 it can be, yes. It's, yeah. As I mentioned before, the certain payroll, the taxes, as long as your budget's there and the margins are there, there's no reason why you can't keep trucking along and growing your business in sunny Costa Rica. Right. What is, what is, uh, what is one of the things you enjoy most about your business? The art of speech. Mm. I love the fact that people, as I mentioned, expand on their vocabulary, really work on their delivery do this practice that I had mentioned, mm -hmm. even relearn how to write in cursive because they forgot how to do it. It's, it's a creative environment. There are versatile skills that will make someone extremely marketable and give them such incredible earnings potential. Mm -hmm. Old school, my friend. Right. These are the sort of things that were taught to us and passed down from our grandparents and parents. Mm -hmm. And I believe is making a comeback because people are getting complacent, getting lazy, and you and I were you know, complaining earlier about only non-voice support chats and emails. And so when I get a chance to work with somebody and do this sort of theater, if you want to consider it, mm. it's incredible. And, and there is such high morale and the synergy that you have in a center like that, it's really addictive. And um, when you walk into a specific environment that is like that, you can really see the growth of the agent where they're cracking codes and getting to different levels. And, and we're really building upon parity, their self-reliance and their self-confidence. Some people leave an office defeated with their you know, shoulders down and their, their, their head looking at the, at the ground, but people leave here recharged hmm. and they're capable of confronting any sort of personal issues they may have outside the office which could potentially be affecting the work that they do here because that's what you and I take into consideration, my friend, right. that they have lives outside of this office. And as long as I can make that happy, then the work that they do here should be double. Right. Um, do you think you could do in the States what you've done in Costa Rica? My friend, I could do this anywhere. I'm the same Richard Blank. You could just put me in any environment and I'll make it happy and fun. Okay. Yes, I could. Yeah. And I'm very selective of the individuals that come in as well. I'd be turning down a lot of people that would be cancers. And I could be able to scale a project. It's Once again, it's a coach. It's a mentor. It's a teacher. We all have our favorite one that encouraged us to continue doing something. And I know that in this professional industry and in call centers, I am capable of being in a very effective leader and a CEO because of the compassion, because I've done it. Right. because I invest in them 
And I will address certain fears that they have initially just to put that to bed real fast. So instead of just absorbing, now they're contributing. Right. And so it's very simple for me because I'm just using the same things that were shown to me growing up in Philadelphia and through my career prior to running my own company, mm. the good bosses and the bad bosses. So I just right. took the best, put my own special sauce on it. And here we are today. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Um, yeah, I just wanted the difference of, you know, Costa Rica has its, I, I guess what I'm, what I'm concerned, I want to say it's, it's more, uh, I guess, work oriented, they have a better work ethic compared to here, I, I would think. Uh, I mean, I think the work ethic here in a lot of places is just going to, going to hell in a handbasket. Um, it's case by case basis, my friend. Yeah. You can have certain, like, you know, they say the Japanese are willing to work themselves to death. I mean, that I also believe is not healthy either. You need yeah. to have a certain balance. But no, I mean, if it, it, you're only as good as your options. And there are people here that will jump from call center to call center just to do the training or just to test the waters. And if they don't like it, they'll just leave because they can always get hired at the hundreds of centers we have here. Wow. But I'm mentioning that work ethics, you only need a certain percentage of the population to work with you. I don't need 100% of the people to work with me. I could right. do one tenth of 1% and still be exceptionally successful. So water seeks its own level. And if I can set the example by myself mm -hmm. and I can have my own balance and focus where I have deep roots and branches, then I can sustain any sort of wind and, 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 and expand myself because I'm not a one trick pony. This is the right. sort of thing where I really have to, I'm exhausted at the end of the days because I'm putting out so much energy, getting it back in return. But these are 15 round days of making sure that these individuals are being their best. And you know how it is as a coach. And one of the things that affected me here, my good friend, was this work from home. I was fortunate enough to be virtual because a lot of companies just closed. Right. But my right. industry with the technology allowed the agents to go home. Now, people like the call centers because of the brick and mortar, the internet redundancy, the backup generator, and immediate IT support. Sure, there's a disruption every now and again. But what I've seen is that there's isolation and people lose those sort of social skills or that sort of passing it forward, me today, you tomorrow sort of philosophy to keep that sort of energy going. Right. I've seen the change. I see it continuing to be a hybrid or purely work from home. But besides that, I'm gonna say it like this. It has a lot to do with the coach, the culture, and the projects that you're offering the agents because if it's something shady, illegal, gray area, or unethical, <laughs> People aren't going to feel comfortable doing it. They're probably not going to want to do it. And if they do do it, those aren't the sort of people that you really want to know because they're selling their soul for a dollar. Right. And as I say, you can really create the environment that you want. And as long as you can live with yourself, sign your name to it and be proud of it, then by all means, you should stand behind it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I know what you're talking about, especially I've had a, I've had a client in the past that used to love to toe that line of, you know, legal, illegal. Mm. And uh, yeah, eventually we stopped working together. It's the time that I was, uh, I was, I got a call from the FBI asking about his business. It's like, <laughs> I know nothing what you're asking about. I'm out. <laughs> yeah. FBI. We have enough problems in our lives. Yeah. And FBI, you can earn FBI dollars does so not have to be one of them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, excellent. Um, do you have any plans for the future in terms of expansion or doing another kind of business? Bring it stateside? I don't know about stateside and I do plan on continuing to expand my company. We're very open-minded for clients, but if I could choose something on a personal side, I'd love to start writing children's books. Oh. I would enjoy doing. So if I give myself a little more leisure time or other areas of focus, you'll, you'll be seeing a lot of books coming out from me. Cool. Cool. So, um, if some, if an American company want to use you, use your call center, I mean, what, what would the, how would the, how would relationships start? How would it build? 
What are the processes? What's the process? What are the steps? I mean, outside of contacting you? I would want to make sure that they do understand the Costa Rican labor laws. That's number one. Secondly, they need to judge me on merit, not on price, because there's no way that we can compete with the offshore, not near shore, the offshore call centers in the Middle East, Philippines, and India. Right. And third, I, I don't want surprises. They need to be very realistic. I want it specific. Their project needs to be measurable. We need to agree upon it. Mm -hmm. It needs to be time frame oriented as well. And as long as those things check out and I feel comfortable moving forward, there's no reason why we can start small and just scale from there. But it has to be something within our profiles. I will reject campaigns if I personally couldn't do it, if it was too technical or they were asking for certain language capacities that I don't understand, like Chinese, for an example. I have nothing against the language, but I wouldn't want to take that account just in case there was a rogue agent and I had no idea what they were saying. So I need to have a little bit of control in order to back up my own accountability for the project. Right, now I'm talking about an American company who wants to use your call center to do something in the United States. Okay, so well, we could work with appointment setting, lead gen, customer support, back office support, just to make sure to supply me with the rhetoric, with the list, with the CRM system, the reporting that you want. We have a quality control department to listen to the calls. Okay. And so I, I think those sort of projects are very exciting for me. Of course. So if you would do a, if you were going to do a lead generation campaign for somebody, you would want them to have their own list? Or is this something you come up with? I don't supply lists, but I do have a couple lead brokers I could recommend. But I would prefer the list to be first scrubbed for the DNC because my US corporation follows all US business and banking laws. They would be signing a contract for my US score. They in turn hire my Costa Rican corp. So I'm paying taxes and following the rules in two companies mm. or countries, excuse me. Okay. But no, the list is one thing they'd have to supply that I can help them write a script. I can work on the rebuttals. If they have, if they don't have a CRM system, we can use mine. It's very easy to use my predictive dollar and my resources here. That's not a problem. Right. If they have something that's plug and play, I think that's fantastic. Why don't you give me some sort of metrics that I could use as the bar and to be able to work with, maybe send some recordings of your top individual for me to study. Mm. Is there a training manual for us to onboard with? How long would you like your training to be? Are there enough checkpoints there? So we just don't have the glazed over nodding for a week just to make sure that people are engaged. Yeah. And so these are the sort of things that I'd want to work with my clients on just to see if A, we're a good fit and B, I'm able to fulfill their needs. That makes sense. It makes a lot of sense that you're covering all of those bases. Now, <clears throat> what kind of campaigns do you do besides lead generation? I can name some verticals that we work with. I work with inbound support for movies and music. We take inbound coordination. support from where? For movies and music campaign, like oh. the old Columbia House. It's like a 55 okay. plus senior uh, female demographic. They receive this big book every year, call us up and order movies and music, which is fascinating for us. Really? Uh-huh. Okay. All right. What else? Work with law firms, law transportation firms? companies, real what estate do companies. What we do, do intake coordination. Some we have a, an account, a very long term client for over a decade. They work they work with wrongful termination mm. laws and disabilities. And so we speak to people sometimes on the worst day of their lives. Wow. And our agents here are phenomenal. They really show sincerity. They listen. They just don't hedge answers by saying, okay, um, wonderful. No, we repeat their information to show active listening. We ask second and third additional questions to ensure we get all of our copious notes down. And so our, our work here is very thorough and the agents find it very rewarding because they know that they're assisting others. It's not just a job where they're punching in and punching out. Right. But I also believe carry in right bus, right seat. An agent might be an all-star in every campaign, but there are some projects where they may feel more comfortable or more effective because it fits more of their specific type of personality. Okay. <clears throat> All right. I'm, I'm, and again, what I'm trying to do is I'm thinking of American businesses. Why would they, what kind of campaigns would they want to maybe think of doing through you? But they, they would want to use me for scalability if they want to compare apples, if there is an uh, overflow of the business that they have. 
if they're looking to downsize because of costs. You know, we do salaries and benefits. If some people try to compare my cost to the United States, they're talking about independent contractors without any sort of overhead. And also pound for pound, unless they need to be on site, you know, all's fair is love and war. And if a virtual agent is capable of producing more than somebody at corporate, or if the labor pool is very small, where somebody is, or they're looking to do something nationwide, I might be an excellent choice for them. Also, since I am from the United States, I do live down here. Sometimes people like that as well. The fact that I had the grit to start my own company, they like that sort of go-getter mentality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I'm more than capable of overseeing training and onboarding agents for somebody. So they should use my expertise, my resources. And the fact that once again, I've been in this industry for 22 years, I am a plethora of information for them. And prior to any sort of contracts, it's my pleasure to show them what I can do. I'll assist them in going over their script. I'll role play with them. I'll make suggestions. And from an educated point of view, Carrie, then they decide to come with me on, on merit, not on price. Right, right. right. So I'm, I'm just, in the little thing on it says somebody's like, what would you use a call center for? I was just trying to give them some examples. Um, cause I know very little about it. I mean, the lead gen makes sense. Um, it's the same with pretty firm. much any other company. It's just the fact that we're virtual. We're 3000 miles away and I might have more infrastructure than your company there. Right. Or maybe tens of thousands of hours and phone calls to analyze where I can show you some metrics and make some suggestions. But let's just say you yourself, Carrie, you're working out of your house for strategic business advisors, don't have anybody working with you. I could be setting appointments for you. If somebody calls in, I could be answering that for you, working on an online calendar, leaving voicemails, prospecting for you, taking the due diligence by looking up websites and LinkedIn profiles to give you more ammunition and information prior to contacting somebody. So there's an excellent way for me to save you time in certain areas of your business so you can focus on other things to grow your business. Right. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. So, you know, just leveraging what you're doing, I guess. Good way to look at it. Have somebody out there making the phone calls and doing the contact. Um, yeah. Interesting concept. Um, so if people want to get in touch with you, how do they get in touch with you? What, what's a good way to get in touch with you? Best thing to do is to buy a plane ticket and come down and fly and visit me there. But if they're not doing that today, they can give me a call, 888-271-6750. Shoot me an email, CEO at Costa Rica's call center.com. And I mentioned earlier about our large Facebook fan page. You're going to be getting tens of thousands of new fans when we put this interview there. And, and your audience, if they want to check it out, it will really give them a pulse of the business outsourcing industry in Central America. Now, for your audience, just for a geography lesson, we are north of Panama, south of Nicaragua. We're the only democratic society in Central America. We have no standing army. So they put all their money back into education. There's a 95% literacy rate. They claim that Costa Rica has the most neutral accent in the best infrastructure in Central America. And also we're known for ecotourism. If people come down here for business, there's also amazing pleasure. You can go to waterfalls and zip lining in the beaches and enjoy yourself with hot springs, monkeys, iguanas, and butterflies. It's a, it's a wonderful Central American tropical paradise where your money goes far, your enjoyment is there, and, uh, and I'm here. So you have a buddy that's here that can make some amazing suggestions for you and your audience, Karen. Right. That sounds great. Um, yeah, I'll make sure and put all that in the comment section underneath the video when, uh, when I get it put up. So people want to, they'll have your number, they'll have your email and have your website too. So uh, yeah, we'll make sure all that happens. Listen, man, it's been very informative. Uh, I appreciate you taking the time out to be here on the podcast today. Um, and to give me some things to think about in terms of, uh, you know, working with a call center and in terms of, I, I guess, getting, reaching out to different businesses for potential, as potential clients. Sure. Yeah. If I can make a suggestion for those that are looking to prospect on their own, when they're calling companies, I, I, I said earlier, do your due diligence 
in case you need to leave a voicemail or send an email, at least custom make it. And when you're speaking to gatekeepers, make sure to do a positive escalation. So when you do get transferred, allowing the decision maker to know how amazing these people are verbally, also do it in writing. So when you happen to call back that company, they are going to thank you for that compliment, give you more of the company culture and add to your momentum. Fantastic tip, man. I hadn't thought of that. That's, That's a million dollar tip. That's good. Yeah. Tip of the day. So yeah, listen, Richard, I appreciate you being on our, our podcast here. Uh, I will have this thing edited and out to you next week. And uh, man, I appreciate you coming on the, on the podcast. And thanks, Gary. We'll have some of your suicide blonde on the way out. Oh, rock on. Excellent. All right, man. You take care. Thank you, Carrie. Suicide blonde. Suicide blonde. Suicide blonde. Suicide blonde. Suicide blonde. Suicide blonde.